On this episode of Skeptico, Rupert Sheldrick returns to Skeptico to talk about his latest book, Science Set Free. I think all these questions of the spiritual are not buried deep in these questions. They're right there under the paper-thin surface of it. Survival of consciousness. I mean, that immediately, for any man on the street as well as any scientist, immediately launches us into deep questions of the spiritual. I don't know how you get around that. Although the science is very relevant to these issues, it doesn't map in such a way that you know, to be an atheist, you've got to be a kind of Dawkins-style materialist, or to be a religious person, you've got to be a dualist. I think what we're heading for is, that in a post-materialist worldview, which is what my book is trying to point the way towards, we could have a holistic way of looking at things, a scientific investigation of things, uh, which leaves these bigger questions open. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on today's episode, we welcome Rupert Sheldrick back to Skeptico. Dr. Sheldrick has a new book out. As a matter of fact, I think today might be the launch day for it in the U.S. It's called Science Set Free, and the set free is from materialism, and he poses many interesting questions to the conventional ideas science is married to with regard to materialism. Interesting book from a fascinating guest. Here's my dialogue with Dr. Rupert Sheldrick. Today we welcome back to Skeptico biologist and author Dr. Rupert Sheldrick. He's here to talk about his latest book, The Science Delusion, or if you're here in the U.S., you'll find it at Amazon under the title Science Set Free. Rupert, welcome back and thanks for joining me. Very good to be with you again. Well, as folks who are longtime listeners of this show probably know, you were not only the first guest on Skeptico, but your work was certainly a source of inspiration for the show. And now all these millions of page views and downloads later, I want to again thank you for helping to send me on this journey. It's been it's been wonderful, and uh, I certainly appreciate the, the guidance that you've given along the way. Well, I'm really impressed with what you've done, Alex. I think that you've moved this whole debate to a new level uh, because you've been able to bring in people from both sides and, um, you know, open up these questions. And before that, there were people in warring camps and who didn't talk to each other. I think yours is probably the only platform uh, which gives, um, you know, free, fair hearing to all points of view in this controversial area. Well, speaking of warring sides, that's probably a great segue into your latest book. And I wanted to, in the introduction there, kind of highlight this title change because I find it quite curious. I I understand that as an author, you can't always control the whims of a publisher who looks to sell more books. But wow, what a... What a change from uh, the science delusion and and everything that that conjures up to a big old smiley face science set free. Uh, Any thoughts on that? Well, in Britain, um, my original title was to do with the dogmas of science and and, uh, liberating science from dogmas. Um, But my British publishers were very keen to call it The Science Delusion because, of course, that plays off the title of Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. And the book is not an answer to Dawkins, and it's not, I mean, he's mentioned a few times in the book, but it's certainly not a kind of polemical response. But the the sales and marketing team in Britain, um, at my publishers, said that the book would sell twice as many, many if it was called The Science Delusion compared with um, my original title. Um, So they twisted my arm and I agreed to it. And I mean, I'm okay with that title. Um, But in the US, the publishers didn't want to call it The Science Delusion. First of all, Richard Dawkins and his book, The God Delusion, are much less well known in the US than they are in Britain. Everybody's heard of it in Britain. In the US, quite a lot have heard of it. But, um, you know, even when I'm talking to friends of mine, in the U.S. and in Canada, um, sometimes I say, you know, the God delusion by Richard Dawkins, and they say, Richard who? And um, they're simply, he's simply not as well known except in the kind of atheist, rationalist, 
crowd. Uh, uh, he's very well known there. Um, the other thing is that for people who haven't heard of him or his book, and who wouldn't get the allusion to the God delusion, um, it, they were afraid that many people in the U.S. would interpret this as a kind of right-wing tract uh, pro-creationism, anti-climate change, because there's a kind of anti-science movement in the U.S. which doesn't really exist in Europe. Um, and they thought people would misidentify this book as a polemical attack on science. In fact, it's pro-science. It's trying to advance science and the scientific agenda uh, by um, helping to free it up from the dogmas that are holding it back. So it's not anti-science, it's pro-science. And Science Set Free captures the meaning, the intention of the book better, actually. Great, great. I'm, I'm glad you, you think so. And I think it, the book is pro-science, and I definitely want to talk about that. And I, I, I guess the way into that is to pull apart this word science. You spend a good deal of time talking about it in the history of science and the philosophy of t science. But of course, as soon as we get in there, we're kind of burdened with this science as a position versus science as a method. And as much as we'd like to kind of look at it in purest terms and say it's a methodology and it's really just a toolkit, it also does represent something in the public discourse we have. Science is a position. So how did you kind of handle that in, in your book? Or what did you se seek to do with this idea that, of being pro-science? Well, you see, I, I'd like the, the science as a method approach. I think science is the best method we have for looking into things and inquiring into things in a cumulative way. And, um, um, but it's held back by dogmas, and it took me a while to realize just what those dogmas are, because when you're learning science, somebody, nobody says, here are the ten dogmas, you know, you've got to believe these. Um, they're not usually spelled out, and most people aren't even aware that they're dogmatic assumptions. Uh, most people within science and outside science think that these are truths, scientific truth. Um, many people who believe in science, they often say, I believe in science, um, uh, think that other people, religious people, have beliefs. Uh, but by contrast, those who believe in science or the scientific worldview know the truth. And so that's um, a, a problem. And um, it's the dogmas, making the dogmas explicit first that was the challenge. And then what I do in the book is turn them into questions. So I'm not saying this dogma is wrong. I'm saying let's take it as a question, not as a fact. For example, the dogma, the mind is inside the brain. The mind is the brain. Uh, it becomes a question, is the mind confined to the brain? The dogma matter is unconscious becomes is matter unconscious the dogma the total amount of matter and energy is always the same becomes the question is the total amount of matter and energy always the same and when one turns them into questions and looks at the evidence the facts uh, what science itself has shown it turns out in every case these dogmatic assumptions are simply assumptions and they're not just assumptions they're actually wrong um, and yet they're the foundations of science as it's currently practiced. Um, and most people aren't even aware they're making those assumptions. So that's really what my book's trying to do. And when I um, turn them into questions, uh, all sorts of new kinds of science become possible, still using the scientific method, still using evidence, still using scientific procedures, reason and logic and all the rest of it. Um, but not bound to this narrow framework, which is holding everything back. You know, I, I want to push that just a little bit further, because early on in the book, you state that science's intellectual prestige is almost unchallenged. Those are your words. And I wonder if there isn't really a flip side to that. At some level, that's true. And at a Another level, it's equally true that science has been fundamentally discredited in recent years. So we can look at climate gate, or we can look at peak oil, or even UFOs and ghosts, even evolution. All those are topics that have kind of come to the fore, and science has had their say, and in one way or another has come out of it pretty battered as a result. I think the average person walking around, certainly in the U.S., will nod their head with the intellectual prestige of science nonsense, but when you really speak to them privately, they, they just don't put a lot of stock in science. 
I think there's more in the U.S. than in most other places. In China and India and in most of Europe, they still do. Um, but I think that you know the, what makes science and its prestige so great is not so much the scientific content of science, but the fact that we all use things like cell phones and computers and fly on jet planes and watch TV and that kind of thing. These technological achievements are completely transforming the planet. And they, they are, but I think, I think people are able to understand technology and engineering and say, wow, this is great. My new iPhone 5 is fantastic. And they're able to separate that from the quote-unquote scientist who stands up there and says this or that about climate change or about any of these other topics that then turn out to be not only provably wrong, but just kind of on the surface of it, silly. I mean, the idea of free will or consciousness or any of these things that wind up with your propositions just looking rather silly. I think people have really internalized the extent to which science just doesn't have these answers. I mean, I think there's some, to some extent that may be true. But the fact is, in many of the areas where scientific dogmas prevail, they're not really challenged very much. They're mostly challenged in areas like consciousness, uh, medicine, and in some of the applications of science. But some of these, I mean, the, the conservation of matter and energy, the idea that memories are stored inside the brain, the idea that laws of nature are fixed, quite a lot of these other dogmas are not very much discussed. And uh, I think that it's, it's when one looks at the whole picture, the broad picture, um, one sees a, a consistent pattern. A lot of the problems that arise from science and its public image at the moment are because of its dogmatism and um, also because of the way in which science is actually pursued, which is not really a culture of open debate and discussion, but a kind of authoritarian system. Um, so I, I, the book, anyway, is an attempt to look at the dogmas in a way that I hope will help those who've already begun to question science and for those who haven't uh, to show that things could be very different from the way they are now and potentially about much better. You know, if someone reads your book, one of the propositions that you make that comes to the forefront pretty quickly is materialism, this idea that your mind is equal to your brain. You are this biological robot. But y you point out I think quite convincingly how flawed this idea really is. But I'm not sure that you answer the next question that I seem to encounter most with people that I talk to, and that's how can this be question? You know, so people say, gee, uh, okay, gee, it sounds very persuasive what you're saying, but how can these people be so fundamentally wrong about such an important question? How can these guys be so wrong? These are the guys we look up to. These are the guys we prop up. This is what everything's built on. How can it be so wrong? Well, I think the simplest way of answering that is to look at the history of it. And the, the history of it is that in the 17th century, the scientific revolution which gave us science as we know it was revolutionary precisely because it broke away from the earlier view, which was that nature was organic, the earth was like an organism, the universe was like an organism, animals and plants were truly living beings with souls. The word animal comes from the Latin word anima for soul. So the previous view was that nature is alive and organic. The machine theory, uh, which is what modern science was based on in the 17th century, said uh, nature is not alive and organic. It's, it's mechanical and unconscious. Matter is un un mechanical. Na animals and plants are just machines. The earth's a machine. The human body's a machine. Uh, the only exception in the whole universe that's not a machine is the human mind, which is not material, not physical, and, um, and God and the angels. These are part of spiritual reality. Everything else is mechanical and unconscious. That's Cartesian dualism, and that was the, the dualism between people and nature, humans and other animals, uh, spirit and matter, which science was based on for two or three centuries. Um, how materialism arose is the materialist said, we don't want this mysterious spirit that you can't measure or touch and it's not in space and time. Instead of two things, matter and spirit or body and mind, there's only one thing, matter, unconscious matter, already defined as unconscious. Uh, mind doesn't exist as something separate from matter and God and angels don't exist anyway. They're just figments of the imagination. Um, and so they collapsed this dualism into a monism, a single thing, materialism, uh, matters the only reality. Um, and 
that doesn't make much difference for engineering or making iPhones and things, but it does make a lot of difference if one's trying to understand the nature of the human mind or consciousness. And that's, of course, the biggest problem with materialism. If matter's unconscious, how come that we're conscious? Um, then they have to say that consciousness is either an illusion or it doesn't actually do anything. It's just a, a sort of like a shadow around the physical activity of the brain. And so consciousness becomes a huge problem and embarrassment for materialism. It's in fact called the hard problem in philosophy of mind. Um, so although materialists have uh, claimed the prestige of all modern science and technology, they're least successful when dealing with the nature of human minds or consciousness. Um, so it's not as if materialism's been very triumphant in that area. It's been extremely untriumphant. It's uh, problematic, bogged down in endless debates and problems. And of course, that is the problem that underlies many of the themes discussed on the Skeptico, uh, in the Skeptico uh, podcast and on the website. Uh, because if the mind is nothing but the brain, then uh, things like telepathy and other psychic phenomena ought not to exist because they imply the influence of the mind at a distance beyond the brain. And so the materialist assumption then leads to a dogmatic denial of psychic phenomena and an attempt at all costs to deny or rubbish the evidence. Um, and so a lot of the dogmatic attitudes we encounter among skeptics, so-called skeptics, um, come from this belief system. So, and it's not just one particular belief, it's part of a whole package of beliefs on materialist worldview, which is what my book is critiquing by taking them apart one by one and looking at the uh, evidence. And I think it does a great job of that, a very convincing job of that. I do have to just kind of play out if we might have to turn the model around, though, instead of science driving this materialism and this materialistic belief system, if it's not the other way around. Because certainly if we look at the extent to which materialism is so enmeshed in our political and economic system in a way that would be almost impossible to pull it out, you just have to wonder if it's a chicken and the egg thing. Can science really rescue us from that? If if we come up with a different worldview that suggests all the things that lie beyond materialism, can we really get there with the kind of political and economic systems we have in place? I don't see why not. Uh, I mean, if we went beyond materialism in the realm of medicine, for example, um, we'd have a medical system that was more inclusive and holistic and probably cheaper. Um, that wouldn't please the pharmaceutical companies, but it would certainly please a lot of national health services and, and medical insurers if one could deliver better health care cheaper um, by uh, getting breaking down the taboos and barriers that presently mean that only mechanistic medicine is treated seriously by these funding and research agencies. Um, I think that's perfectly doable. There's already plenty of people doing it. It's just not political mainstream at the moment. Um, and I don't think that would be a huge reform, uh, a difficult reform. Um, I think politically, uh, a non-materialist science, a post-materialist science that was more organic or holistic, um, would be much more compatible with people's own experience. Uh, it would be much more compatible with a, a healthier relationship to the environment. And I think that these things would probably be quite popular politically. Um, I don't think that this is, uh, materialism isn't an essential part of uh, the apparatus of government, state, and industry. It is right now, but materialism only became the predominant view within science by the late 19th century. Um, before that, most scientists were dualists and um, found no problem. Most governments were dualists. and. Um, Dualism, I'm not a dualist myself, I think it's too limited a view, but um, it meant there was more harmony between science and religion. They lived in kind of separate compartments. Uh, materialism leads to uh, an onslaught in its more militant forms on any form of religious belief. And that's deeply upsetting politically for a lot of people. I mean, that's why in the U.S. there's this kind of religious right backlash, which is largely confined to the U.S., but I think... One can only see the context for that in, in, in a kind of militant materialism, which asserts that science disproves God, evolution shows there's no such thing as God, um, 
science is right, therefore um, God doesn't exist. And Richard Dawkins was professor of public understanding of science at Oxford, and his atheist views in his mind are simply equated with science. So if one equates science with atheism and materialism, then you're going to alienate a lot of people and cause big political backlashes. And so I think it's done more harm than good and actually creates more problems, far more problems than are necessary. I don't know about more harm than good, but I I think personally it really brings the question more into focus, more honestly and fairly, more on the table than to otherwise obscure it. Because that's the one part I guess I really want to push on is at the end of the day, the end of materialism means the end of atheism. And that's what we're fighting about. And I think it requires us to to seriously consider all sorts of questions about the spiritual, quote-unquote. And again, I think that's what this debate, the underlying fight, is all about. So don't we need to be more upfront about that, and particularly in these alternative sciences like parapsychology? Don't we have to deal with that head-on? Let me take that one small step further. I mean, to me, the implications are clear. If consciousness survives death, which seems to be most likely true, then that's just as just about every religion throughout time has told us. And if there is some hierarchical order to consciousness, again, something that seems to be indicated by the data we have, then that sure sounds like something that we would call God, most religions would call God. So aren't these issues, aren't these topics, these spiritual topics, really right there under the surface of that? And isn't that what we're really fighting about? Well, I don't think it's as simple as that. Um... Because, for example, take parapsychology. Among parapsychologists, some types of parapsychologists are materialists and atheists. Others are Christians, others are Buddhists or Hindus. But Rupert, that's just Christians. because they've sold out to try and get some scientific legitimacy. They've, you know, adopted these atheistic ideas in a way that I think, I, I'd like you to point out one of them that has any kind of consistent theory for how atheism could possibly be compatible with survival of consciousness. I mean, what, super psi? I mean, what are we talking I mean, there are several quite eminent parapsychologists who are atheists, and Dick Behrman in Holland, for example, Richard Broughton, who used to be at the Rhine Center, now at the University of Northampton in England, um, Damien Broderick, who writes popular books on and science fiction and knows a lot about parapsychology. He's an atheist and a materialist. But does any of that make any sense to you? Well, the thing is that... It does, actually. I mean, what they, Ed May, who, you know, did the Stargate research, he's a materialist and atheist, and yet an eminent parapsychologist. So there isn't a simple correlation between parapsychology and, and religious belief. Um, no, what they hope for, and what I think is a real alternative, is that the narrow dogmatic materialism we now have could be replaced by a kind of organic, holistic worldview, which wouldn't necessarily imply uh, the existence of God. It would be perhaps pantheistic or animistic without being theistic or deistic. Um, So I think there's an intermediate position, which is not either just atheistic materialism or full-blown religion and spirituality. I think there is an intermediate position where I think it could still be possible to be an atheist, um, uh, but not Uh, on the basis of this narrow dogmatic materialism, but on a much more sophisticated form of materialism. You you sound much less convincing in that argument, in that position. I don't think that's your position, and and I just... No, it's not my position, but, but what I don't want, you see, I think it's really important to decouple arguments about atheism and religion, which get people passionately involved with articles of personal faith and personal experience. I think we can decouple it from religion, but but from spirituality, I think that's part of the problem. I think all these questions of the spiritual are not buried deep in these questions. They're right there under the paper-thin surface of it. Survival of consciousness. If we just look at the data and we say, well, that that seems to suggest that, yeah, consciousness survives death— I mean, that immediately, for any man on the street, as well as any scientist, immediately launches us into deep questions of the spiritual. I don't know how you get around that. Well, I mean, survival of consciousness 
is you know one aspect of religion or spirituality but there have been spiritual people including many jews for thousands of years who are religious and spiritual but don't believe in survival of consciousness so again there's not a hundred percent correlation between these points of view you know even at the time of jesus one of the great debates going on at the time the new testament was uh, being formulated in the life of jesus and then in the subsequent discussions was you know the sadducees the temple priests didn't believe in survival whereas the pharisees did and this was a really big debate and that debate still goes on in the in the jewish community so it's it's uh, even though both sides are devout religious people with a spiritual experience and and dimension so i think it's quite important to decouple these although the science is very relevant to these issues it doesn't map in such a way that you know, to be an atheist, you've got to be a kind of Dawkins-style materialist, or to be a religious person, you've got to be a dualist. Um, or um, I think what we're heading for is that in a post-materialist worldview, which is what my book is trying to point the way towards, we could have a holistic way of looking at things, a scientific investigation of things, uh, which leaves these bigger questions open. And for example, in one chapter of the book, where I'm dealing with the dogma that memories are stored as material traces inside the brain, uh, that becomes the question, are memories stored as material traces in brains? Um, I myself don't think memories are stored in brains. I think that brains are more like tuning devices, uh, you know, more like TV receivers than like video recorders. Now, that has, that's really a scientific question, how is memory stored? And we can do experiments to try and find out how it is, how memory works. It has religious implications because materialism says um, if memories are stored, that memories are stored in brains, the brain decays at death, therefore all memories are wiped out at death. There's no possibility of any kind of survival, personal survival, without memory. And so for materialists, it's a simple two-step argument. Memories are stored in brains, the brain decays at death, therefore memories are wiped out at death. Therefore, all theories of survival, reincarnation, purgatory, the last judgment, you know, all these, all theories are wiped out. Whereas if memories are not stored in brains, if they depend on a resonance process, uh, then the memories themselves are not wiped out at death. They're potentially accessible. But that doesn't prove they are accessed, that there is personal survival. It just means that's a possibility. Whereas with materialism, it's an impossibility. So one position leaves the, posi- it leaves the question closed and the other leaves it open. Uh, one last question, Dr. Sheldrick. What do you think is the future for academia vis-a-vis materialism? It is, again, it seems so enmeshed, so institutionalized at this point. I know that you've mentioned that your son is studying for his PhD. First of all, congratulations to him on that. But let's say he came to you and said he wanted to pursue a career in academia. What advice would you give him for trying to one, either get along with the system as it is or, or change it in the direction that you'd like to see change happen? Well, he's doing his PhD in tropical ecology uh, in a way that's not particularly reductionist. It's a more holistic kind of ecological fieldwork approach. So he's not confronting these questions in a direct personal way. Um, but I think that the, there are plenty of people in academic science who are not materialists, One of the points I try to make in my book is that um, a great many scientists nowadays are are not materialists, they're not atheists. The the culture of science, and indeed of the academic world, is generally speaking atheistic and materialistic. Um, But that's the kind of surface culture, what people pay lip service to in public. In private, there's a great many people with different views. There are a lot who are spiritual but not religious. There are a lot who are religious. There are a lot who've had mystical experiences. There are a lot who have psychic experiences. Um, and uh, there are a lot who've uh, been to alternative practitioners and take seriously various alternative healing methods. Um, in fact, add all those up, and I think they would be the majority of people within science. Uh, a further point is that if we look at young scientists today, the scientists of the future. Uh, Last year, India graduated 2.5 million science and engineering uh, graduates. 
China one and a half million, the US half a million, Britain 100,000. But in Britain and the US, about a third of them at graduate level uh, were Indians, Chinese, and Koreans. So the majority of young scientists in the world today are not European or American, mm -hmm. or uh, they're um, Asian. And the Chinese have an ambiguous attitude. Some are very materialist, some are interested in Taoism and traditional Chinese beliefs. Most Indians, the great majority of Indian scientists, are pretty straightforward Hindus and Muslims when they're off duty. Um, they're, they're not um, materialists and atheists. So most scientists today simply don't fit into that position. But when they're at work, they, they don't mention it. They pretend to go along with that overall, you know, that kind of what seems like a consensus reality. As soon as they're off duty, they revert to completely different views. I would say the majority of scientists, in fact, um, have at least a split life. What I'm proposing is that um, scientists come out, speak much more freely about their own experiences and interests to their colleagues, and they'll find that a great many of the others share these interests or have things that they they can talk about fruitfully. Uh, that this materialist dogmatism is a facade uh, behind which uh, there are some true believers. Richard Dawkins is certainly one, and he's done us all a service by making these views so explicit and expressing them so forcefully. Um, but uh, I think the majority uh, don't have those views. I think of it as being rather like Russia under Brezhnev. Um, you know, in that late communist phase of the Soviet Union, in public, almost everyone went along with Marxism and dialectical materialism. A few dissidents stood out against it and were sent to uh, psychiatric institutions, but um, the majority just went along with it as if they believed it, and you know they dutifully clapped at public meetings to speeches by the party leaders and so forth. But when the Soviet Empire collapsed, how many really believed it? Probably only quite a small minority. Uh, I think it's rather like that in science, and so I think uh, that when people feel free to come out and speak freely, and when scientists feel they don't have to pay lip service to this dogma. Um, they, it's not as if the whole academic world will suddenly oppose it as one person. They won't. A lot of people would be enormously relieved, and I think the academic world would get a new lease of life through people being able to speak and think more freely. Well, that's certainly a, a wonderfully optimistic future that you paint, and let's hope we get there. Rupert, tell folks what's coming up for you. Again, the book available right now at Amazon, Science Set Free, 10 Paths to New Discovery. What's coming up in terms of your speaking lecture circuit? It seems like we're always hearing about you, and you're popping up with some new YouTube videos and the like, which is great to hear. What's uh, coming up for you in the near future? Well, in the near future, in uh, San Francisco, September the 7th, at California Institute of Integral Studies, I'm giving a book launch lecture for this book, which is published in the U.S. and Canada on September the 4th. Um, September the 8th, I'm giving a, a week-long workshop on it. Um, the following weekend at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, I'm doing a weekend workshop on the themes of this book. Um, those are my main things in September. Then I'm going back to England. I'm in Canada right now. Um, and I'm going to the U.S. again in November. Um, uh, I'm going to be doing some talks in New York, mainly at the Open Center. Uh, I'm not doing anything in between. And my publisher said there's no point trying to do book promotion before a presidential election in the U.S., uh, uh, so that so I'm I'm not coming back till a week after the presidential election when hopefully the hanging chads will have been sorted out, and I'll be able to um you know things are, things should be getting back to normal, um so that's the main thing and meanwhile there will be various YouTube's uh, uh, and and um, discussions about the book, um there's already some lectures online uh, about the book from my presentations in England. And anyone who's interested can see them there on my website, www.sheldrake.org. Um, and anyone who's interested in knowing where I'll be speaking, what I'll be doing, can sign on for my, can look at the website or sign on for my e-newsletter, uh, which I send out only every couple of months, but it gives an update on my various activities for those who are interested. Great. I get those emails, and it is 
nice that they're on a regular basis, but you don't overwhelm folks with useless information. So it's very well done. Well, Dr. Sheldrick, thanks again for joining us today. Best of luck with the book. And hopefully we'll, we'll touch base with you again in the not too distant future. Good. Thanks very much. And all the best to you and the great work you do. Thanks again to Dr. Sheldrick for joining me today on Skeptico. A couple of questions I guess I'd tee up. I think the main thrust of this book is topics that we've covered over and over and over again in terms of materialism, but I particularly like the way that he's drawn out these assumptions that materialism is based on and turned them into rather provocative questions that even when one first hears them, you're kind of drawn to say, yeah, why would I assume that that's true? So I think it might be interesting to flesh some of those out on the forum and discuss those questions. If someone would like to do that, that'd be much appreciated. And the second topic I'd want to discuss is this last one that I brought up with him, and it keeps popping up for me at least, and that is this connection between a post-materialism scientific world and the spiritual. So again, to me, it's clear that as soon as we get past materialism, we have to confront head-on these questions of spirit. Are there spiritual beings? What happens to consciousness after we die? And I'm not advocating that we approach those from at all a religious standpoint, but from a scientific standpoint, the best way we can, it just seems to me clear that those questions come to the forefront right away as soon as we make that step beyond materialism. So it will be interesting to see what you have to say about that. Of course, the place to connect is on the Skeptico website. It's at S-K-E-P-T-I-K-O dot com. As I mentioned in a previous episode, there's a new version of the comment section that makes it really handy to follow threaded conversations. So I invite you to check that out in the comment section of the website. And then, of course, there's the forum, which is a very popular place for folks to kind of hash out some of these ideas. Either one of those places are the place to go. And of course, you can always email me or connect with me on Facebook. I try to get to as many of those as I can. I can't always get to all of them, but I try. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. I have several interesting shows coming up. Be sure to stay with me for all of that. Be sure to tell your friends and blog and write about Skeptico whenever you can. It's interesting that we've had a steady uptick in Skeptico listenership, but especially in the last month or two, it's really kind of kicked into gear. And maybe that's just because I've been putting these out every week. I don't know how much longer I can keep that up, but I will try. So again, that's it for today. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.